So as you can see, the crash damaged BMW M135i is all finished. Now, when I first got it done, then my idea was to jump in the car, give your first impression straight off the bat. But as soon as I jumped into the car, that idea got scuppered because I could see straight away there was a problem with the tracking. Even though I tried to get that new track control arm, you know, adjusted exactly the same as it should be. And there were a few other issues as well. So I had to get that fixed first before I could give you guys the proper test drive. But when I did jump in and give it a start up, then it gave me a really good first impression. And let's jump in it now and I'll show you what I mean. So it may seem like a small thing, but this is what it sounds like when you first start it up. And even though I've been driving it for a while now, that little blip on the throttle that it gives when you first start it up, when you go out to the car, I still really love it. And then for a while at least, I think it's something to do with exhaust baffles or something, some clever BMW trickery. It sounds really nice, you know, for the first few minutes of running. And you can really hear that really distinctive note from the straight six turbo engine. Well, let's get out there and drive it now and I'll talk you through what I think are the good and bad points about this car. So the first thing that I look for in a car is the engine. So I've had some cars with great engines in the past and I'd heard that all of these three litre turbos in the one series were all great engines. And so that's one of the main things that made me want to buy this one. Now I'm going to be honest with you, the first time I jumped in this car and drove it, I thought, where have all the horses gone? Are they still in the corral or have they ridden off into the sunset? And that's because even though I've owned a lot of performance cars in the past, I'm not actually that fast a driver. So when I'm driving a 300 plus horsepower car, I expect um, the power to just be there, be really evident, just in normal cruising, you know, pulling out at a junction, speeding up slightly to join a big road, you know, down a slip road or whatever. And this N55 three litre turbo engine in, it doesn't really deliver the power in that way. And so in my early drives, when I was just getting used to the car, of course I was taking it easy. And it took a comment from a friend <laughs> to wake me up a bit. And his comment was, stop driving it like a diesel, Phil. You have to rev these cars to get the performance out of them. But anyway, I'm getting a bit more used to it now. And it is a great engine. You just have to rev it a bit more in order to make it sing. Okay, so next up, let's talk about the transmission. So I know there's a whole raft of you guys out there who've all gone for the autos with their paddle shift. They're faster, they're more precise and everything else. But I'm a little bit old school and there's a lot of people like me who like a good manual box. And let's face it, it's the manual transmission that joins all the dots together. There's the great engine we talked about a minute ago, took some getting used to. And then there's the human and then there's going through the gears and putting that power down onto the road. And that's what you need a good manual transmission for. And I'm pleased to say that this car does have a good manual transmission. I've been using it a lot. It's precise. I know exactly what I'm doing with it. And the gears match the engine uh, really well. So you wouldn't expect anything less from BMW, but I'm here to give you that confirmation. talk about suspension and handling if you've been on any of the forums for these sort of cars the owners all say they don't handle very well and you need to modify them in order to get them to handle well lowering springs and Bilstein suspension and things like that well I just haven't found that to be honest I'm on this bumpy back road now and so you might find the cameras jostling around a little bit, but the traction's great. And I know exactly what's going on, you know, I can feel it and it seems to grip pretty well. So I have no problem with the stock suspension at all. Maybe it gets even better with all the Bilstein stuff, but the standard car, it's nice to drive. You know, it has a lot of poise over the bumps and it's just hard enough to remind you that it's sports suspension and it removes all of the lean you know there's not excessive body roll and things like that so i'll be honest i love it so next up steering so as with all modern cars it's got this electric or electronic steering 
And when it first came out, I just wasn't a big fan, if I'm honest. Because a lot of the early systems, they were pretty awful. BMW and other manufacturers are really getting on top of it now. So I'd say this steering's good, but it'll never be excellent, which is what I would class a hydraulic rack, or even, God forbid, a non-assisted rack. You just can't beat those things for feel because there's just less components and things in between you and the steering. So yeah, it's good. You can feel what's going on, it's precise. Um, it's not overly light, or oh, some of them are overly light, these modern cars, and it's absolutely awful. You know, how can you feel what's going on if you're twiddling the steering with one hand? <laughs> uh, but anyway, this one's pretty good and I do like it. So one key thing is, is it fast? Well, yeah, once you wind it up, But one other thing is the sport button. I know that people think of these sport buttons as a bit of a gimmick, but in this car, it transforms the car. Suddenly, instead of being lazy, it's eager. And probably it's all just software, you know, so a little input on the throttle, they ramp it up so it gives you more. But it just makes the car feel much more lively and much more enjoyable to drive. In fact, I almost always drive it in sport. And while we're talking about the driving modes, don't ever drive it in Eco Plus. Honestly, you'll lose the will to live. It's so sluggish and it feels like it's a one liter car and it weighs two tons. And even for just like normal cruising on the motorway, if you're in Eco Plus, you start to give the throttle just a little bit, you know, to keep up with traffic or to breeze past someone and it just doesn't respond. So. I, I haven't even noticed that it gives more MPG, to be honest, so I'm not even sure what the plus signs are of that. So let's summarize. Do I like the car? No, I absolutely love the car. And let's face it, I'd be mad not to. It's fast, it's responsive, it handles well. The visibility is great, which might seem a small thing, but it means it's really chuckable because it gives you the confidence because you know exactly what's going on around you, you know. The brakes I haven't mentioned up till now, they're phenomenal. It's got four pot Brembo's on the front. And to, to add to that, it's something of a performance car bargain at the moment because you can get cars like this for say like 12 to 14,000. And I don't think there's anything out there that will give this sort of performance for that sort of money. Especially not anything with this sort of build quality and reliability. And we haven't even talked about tunability yet. Because even though this car goes quite well, one of the things they're really well known for is being able to tune them and get even more performance out of these engines. So is there anything I would change about the car? Well, actually there is one thing. And that is this car, believe it or not, at 320 horsepower and rear wheel drive has no limited slip dip as standard. I mean, BMW, come on, what were you thinking? No limited slip diff in a high performance car like this. Rear wheel drive <laughs> is just madness, it beggars belief. Now, of course, BMW sell you one, uh, so you can go down to your local dealer and say, oh, I'd like the M Sport diff, please. But from what I've heard, and I haven't, I haven't even priced it up myself, you're talking about £1,500 for this diff. And then, of course, there's installation. Yeah, I, I don't think I'll bother on this car. If I was going to keep it forever, uh, you know, a long-term car, then uh, probably I'd think about it because at the moment it's a bit damp on the roads. And as soon as that happens, then all the performance isn't available to you. You know, it's very traction limited and the traction control starts working overtime. There's still lots coming up on this car because there are some modifications I'd like to do to it. You know, improvements, things to the style in the looks and the performance. Okay, so I've got pretty much all of the repair work done now on the BMW M135i. And I've really enjoyed the process, but now we can turn our eyes to the second part of the project. And this is another bit that really excites me and it's personalization of the car. And so today, for the first time ever, I'm going to be doing some wrapping. And no, I'm sure you'll be pleased to know, I don't mean this sort of wrapping. What I'm talking about is carbon fibre wrapping some of the interior trim. 
Now I know some of you are gonna go bananas down in the comments because there's a big group of people out there who just don't like carbon fiber look stuff anymore. But I still think it can look really good if it's done well and also it's done in the right areas to a good standard. And that's what I'm gonna try to do. What I'm aiming for is carbon fiber interior trim that looks the same as some of the really high-end performance BMWs. So I watched some videos where they actually wrap all of the trim in place in the car, but you get the best results by removing the trim. So that's what I'm doing here, starting with the glove box trim. And basically these were the clips that we were undoing. And a lot of modern BMWs will have exactly the same clips as these. So if you've got a different model than this car, then probably you'll undo that in a similar sort of way. And I'm just removing the door handle and the heater vent trims in exactly the same way. And I removed the center console exactly the same, using the trim tools to work from the back edge and then working forward, because there's a little hook at the front. Uh, but it was pretty easy to do. And then I just had to unplug and unscrew the iDrive controller. The next thing I needed to do was to use some panel wipe and a microfiber cloth to clean all of the parts. Just to make sure there's no grease and oils or any contaminants on the surface. That'll stop the film from sticking properly. And you just have to repeat the process for all of the parts that you intend to wrap. I didn't know how often I'd do this sort of work, so I just bought an inexpensive vinyl wrap tools kit off of Amazon and it seemed to have pretty much everything in it that I needed. Um, here what I'm doing is I'm just lining it up because what I learned is if you're using a film with a pattern, you have to plan which direction it's gonna go across the part. And you do that for all of the uh, pieces of trim in the interior so they all match and go together really well. Uh, once you've cut the piece out, you can just lay it down on whatever work surface you're working on and then drop the piece onto it. That's the easiest way to get it positioned. Obviously flip it over then and start smoothing it down. And it's quite easy, you just kind of work your way along and what you're aiming to do is to get all of the bubbles out and all of the creases and things like that. Now if you do get a crease, you can just peel it back like I'm doing here and stretch it a little bit and then just keep smoothing it and you'll, you'll get it, you know, you'll get it back out again, no problem. And you can see there's quite a curve here and just taking your time it is quite time consuming. You can work your way along the part. Once you're happy with it and you're not going to be pulling it back anymore, then you can trim off some of the excess uh, because it gets quite awkward. And what you're going to try to do now is tuck it round the back. And tucking it round the back and sticking it really well in place is what keeps your part looking nicer for longer uh, because it holds the film and then you don't get it peeling back later. The various knives and spatulas were really useful for this. Sometimes you have to cut a little relief cut at the corners in order to get it stretched around. And then th there might be some areas where the film starting to foul some of the fasteners and uh, little molded parts. Now you have to trim round these otherwise you'll find the part won't pop back into place later. Uh, so I found that out. Now I didn't use a lot of heat but in some areas where the film was particularly reluctant then heat came in really handy to smooth it down. And now for the iDrive controller, obviously you have to do a cutout. So I started off cutting a little X in it and then stretching the film through. And then I think I might have cut a little bit more, but the key thing is don't cut too close to the edges because you want it to look nice and tidy like this once you've finished. Now I'll just show you quickly the door handle because it's a much more uh, curvy piece. And as you can see, I got more creases, but by now I was getting more confident with the heat and the heat makes a huge difference as you can see. It allows you to stretch the film around the part much more easily and avoid getting creases and you end up with a nice looking part like this. Okay, so time for the installation. So I'm just putting the iDrive controller back in. There's just a few screws for that. And then at one end of the center console trim, there's a little hook. So you slide that in first and then you push it down in place. And it's exactly the same for the door handle trim. You just hook it on at the bottom and then you just squeeze to snap it in place. And I'm pretty happy with the results, but let me know what you think in the comments. Ooh, it's the next day now and it's gotten a lot colder. So if you remember from the last video for the crash damage car rebuild, I talked about taking the car for an MOT and getting an interesting surprise. And I'll get to that in a minute, but it's all about the tuning potential of the N55 engine that's in these M135Is. 
So let me give you a little bit of background first and then you'll know where I'm going with it. Now, if you want to tune one of these cars, then ideally you need three things. The first one is a panel filter, which sits inside here. And I showed it in a previous video and I've got a sports panel filter already. This is by far the cheapest of the three items because it only costs about 40 quid. The second item on the list are the inlet charge pipes. The standard BMW ones are plastic. And if you tune your car and you're running higher boost pressures, then they can crack and break and then that can cause you problems. So these are a good idea to change if you are gonna tune the car to avoid issues further down the line. They haven't been changed on my car and they're really easy to check because if they're plastic, then they're the original ones. But it only costs about 80 quid to replace them with some inexpensive metal ones which will be up to the job so it's not too much of a big deal and the third item that you need is a larger exhaust downpipe because it allows more flow through the exhaust which improves the performance but as this is also where the cat sits you've kind of got two choices really you can either go for a larger decatted downpipe but you'll definitely get problems on the MOT for emissions. Or you can put a sports cat in. And this is what the chaps at BK Motors showed me when my car was up on the ramps. And with their experience, they could see straight away that this isn't the standard downpipe that came with the car as standard. And because I was having the emissions checked as part of the MOT and it passed, then they knew it was a sports cat. And so that's really good news for me because it's no surprise to you that a sports cat is a really expensive item to the tune of about 400 quid. Now, my personal opinion is this car has definitely been tuned before. It's got the panel filter, it's got the sports cat, but it seems like the previous owner, one of them anyway, was just taking a risk on the intake pipes and that's why they've still got the plastic ones fitted, but that's not something that I'd be willing to do. Now that probably all sounds like good news to you guys, but it leaves me with a bit of a dilemma. And I'll tell you why. You see, in the last crash damage rebuild video, I promised you a review of the numbers now that the car is reaching completion. And let's go through them now and then you'll hopefully see what my problem is. So I bought this car for 8,000 pounds from a salvage auction. An auction fees and delivery for this car was £1,063. And then I rebuilt the car as cost effectively as possible without cutting corners. And that's cost me a total of £2,325. It was 11,388 quid all in total. So that's what the car stands me at. Now about nine months ago when I first got this car, I'd have been sitting pretty because the cars were going for about 14 and a half. This one stands me at about 11 and a half and that leaves a little bit of wriggle room for tuning and personalization and things. And now car insurance premiums for these cars have been skyrocketing and that means lots of people have been selling them and that's brought the prices down so now the average price for a car like this one is about 12 grand which means I'm already pretty much at the break-even price for this car if I spend nothing more and my understanding is if I tune the car it actually doesn't add that much to the value so it's a real difficult decision for me I'd love to see what your views are in the comments if I spent a little bit of money tuning this car, could I expect to get a little bit more for it? You know, does that give me some wriggle room? Because, because I find the 400 horsepower potential of this car really tempting. Because I'm a full-time YouTuber, I have to get the money I put in back out of the cars, ready to put into the next one. So I can't afford to lose money on them, really. I have no regrets because I've really enjoyed the experience of owning and driving this car. And I always really enjoy the process of fixing it up. But I'm starting to wonder if it's time for me to stop at this point and then move on to the next one. So uh, we'll see. Uh, let me know what you think. I'm always interested to hear what the viewers, do you want to see more for this car? Or are you ready for something new? In the next video, I'm back on with my Porsche 914 project. And this time it's exciting because it's floor pans getting installed, <laughs> which seem a basic requirement for any car. So I'm glad to finally be getting it done. Hopefully you're enjoying the content and if you're not already one of my subscribers then please consider subscribing, it would be great to have you along for the ride. I bet there's not many other YouTubers out there doing salvage car rebuilds alongside classic car restorations so you're getting something a little bit different from me. Thanks for watching and hopefully I'll catch you in the next video.